decision in difficult times. Last time we were here, we shared chapter 3, and we talked about Haman. We called him horrible Haman. From some people, you learn everything you don't want to be, and, and that's valuable. But Haman, he had a hatred for the Jews. Uh, they, they were scattered all throughout the entire empire, and, and he hated them, and he wanted them gone. And one way or another, he made his way into a position under the king and proposed a, a decree to the king that, uh, that they kill all the Jews. And, and, it, and, and they got it done. They, they, it wasn't carried out yet, but they got the decree passed. I wonder how many Jews there were in the land. It was, you know, I, I wonder what kind of escape they would be able to make. You know, where could they go? We've talked about how this, this kingdom covered such a, a vast area uh, of land. It went from India to Ethiopia, and there just wasn't much access out of the kingdom. It, it, it wouldn't be a please, easy place to get away from. And, but, but where we left off was with Haman and the king, and they're having a feast right after passing this decree, this murderous decree to kill all of these people. So they're feasting. The Jews are going to be frightened in the land at, at this decree. At the moment here where we are, Queen Esther does not know that this decree has been passed upon the Jews. She doesn't know anything about it. Mordecai does. Mordecai is in a special position. He does have a place of authority in the land. He does do business at, at the, the gates where, where business takes place. He is a Jew. He knows about this. And, and a whole lot of people say, well, what can one man do? You know, when somebody te uh, steps up to take a stand to get something, there's always that one that'll say, what do you think you're going to do? Save the whole world just in one person? Well, we're going to look at this one man and the stand that he takes for what is right and what he gets started. There are others that get involved, but we're going to see what he gets started. And so... Look with me in verses 1 through 3 tonight at the concern of Mordecai. It says, When Mordecai perceived all that was done, the passing of the decree to kill the Jews, what Haman did to get in that position and, and uh, get the king to pass this and okay this, then Mordecai rent his clothes and put on sackcloth with ashes and went out into the midst of the city and cried with a loud and a bitter cry and came even before the king's gate for none might enter into the king's gate clothed with sackcloth. And in every province whithersoever the king's commandment and his decree came, there was great mourning among the Jews and fasting and weeping and wailing and many in sackcloth and ashes. Mordecai had a concern about what was taking place here. He was heavily burdened. He was full of grief. And you combi combine that with his bravery and having no shame in where he stood, and you have a man that's ready to stand for what is right. We've already learned that he exposed the fact that he was a Jew. We found that in chapter 3 and at the end of verse 4. It says, for he had told them that he was a Jew. So he hid his nationality for a while, but he has told them now. And at this point, he has come to publicly uh, expressing his opposition to this murderous decree. Thank God for the Christian who will take a stand for what is right. Even if he 
he or she does so on their own at first. Thank God for Mordecai that he didn't get beat up with the doubt or the naysayers that say you can't save the world uh, or anything like that. Thank God for him because, look, God can do anything, but what if he just left it to who we're about to talk about and nothing was done? That would be bad news for the Jews. I don't think God would have left it that way. Nevertheless, he steps up. You know, he doesn't... Do, it's not just about praying. Prayer is the first and most important thing that we ought to do. And in some cases, in some situations, that's all we can do. But in other cases, there's something to do after prayer. Especially here when it comes to a matter of life and death. And in many of our situations, we're to pray, we're to be concerned, we're to pray, and then we're to express that concern. It is to go into action. And that's what we see here with Mordecai. He, the Lord leads us to do something about evil. And Mordecai is doing something about the evil. You know, the Lord knows our awareness of the evil in situations around. And, and, and of course, He knows what He lays on our heart to do. And, and there's a time to be obedient and to act upon what the Lord would have us to do. He knows our awareness and He knows when He convicts us to take a stand. And this is a matter of life and death. And Proverbs 24, 11 would, would have something to say that, that would pertain to this very situation. Those, that verse says, If thou forbear to deliver them that are drawn unto death, and those that are ready to be slain, if thou sayest, Behold, we knew it not, doth not he that pondereth the heart consider it, and he that keepeth thy soul... Doth not he know it? And shall not he render to every man according to his works? We can't be neutral on matters of evil. You know, a matter of life and death here, you, you might think about the, the killing of babies today. You know, to say, to say, I would never do that, but to each their own, let them do what they want, that's being just as guilty. If we don't take a stand against something, our stand is that we're for it. Our concern is to become action. And this one man, Mordecai, is stepping up to take a stand against this evil. He mourned and he cried. He wailed all throughout the city. He put on sackcloth and ashes and went all throughout the city everywhere. And then he marched himself right up to the gate with the sackcloth. That's, that's your mourning clothes, the, the, not time of day mourning. That's your sorrowing clothes. That, that's when you're, you're grieving, you, you put on sackcloth. And, and in the city is something that people did. Nobody went to the gate with sackcloth on. Nobody went to the gate in their mourning clothes, but, but Mordecai does. And he is wailing in sorrow and grief over what happened. I mean, he's, cause, he's throwing a big fit, and he's causing a big episode at the gate where he shouldn't be with sackcloth on. Why, why would he do that? Well, Esther is the queen and though he raised her, and, and she's his kin, he, he did not have access to the queen. He could not go and get this message to her. But if he goes to the gate, and he starts acting crazy in his sackcloth, and that, don't get me wrong, that was, it was sincere grief that, that he was going through over the people, but he purposed to go to the gate so that that word might get to the queen what's going on with Mordecai at the gate with sackcloth on. That's why he would do that, and he went there with an outburst, hoping to get Esther's attention since he could not approach her. So he had a concern, he had a compassion about the situation, but it's not, that's not just something you feel. 
That's something you act on, and God gives you something to do about it. So let's go from the concern to the communication in verses 4 through 9. So Esther's maids and her chamberlains came and told it her. It it was successful what he did. Then was the queen exceedingly grieved, and she sent raiment to clothe Mordecai and to take away his sackcloth from him, but he received it not. Then called Esther for Hatak, one of the king's chamberlains, whom he had appointed to attend upon her, and gave him a commandment to Mordecai to know what it was and why it was. So Hatak went forth to Mordecai under the street of the city, which was before the king's gate, and Mordecai told him of all that had happened unto him and of the sum of money that Haman had promised to pay the king's treasury for the Jews to destroy them. Also he gave him the copy of the writing of the decree that was given at Shushan to destroy them, to show it unto Esther and to declare it unto her and to charge her that she should go in unto the king to make supplication unto him and to make request before him for her people. And Hatak came and told Esther the words of Mordecai. Here we see the communication that starts to take place. Mordecai was successful in in getting the queen's attention, not directly, but at least through a messenger, he can communicate with her. And, And when word got to Esther what Mordecai was doing, she didn't give... Uh, the right initial response, she di- or, or she didn't give a full response. She just rushed kind of in a panic and an urgency, and she grabbed some linen, some proper clothes for him to have on at the gate, and she had those clothes sent to him. So she, she didn't get what Mordecai was trying to get across yet. So therefore, when the clothes came to him, He refused them. He rejected to take what would keep him safe, what would keep him from getting in trouble. And and so when she got word that he rejected those clothes that she sent to him, now she sends back a message and she asks, okay, what is wrong? She She could have saved that step by sending the clothes and asking what is wrong. But whatever the case... The, the messaging and the communication is starting to go back and forth. And along comes this man, Haytack. We didn't introduce him in the introductory message. He is one of the king's chamberlains, and he is to serve the queen and do whatever she wants. And so Haytack has no idea what important role he is about to play in what is taking place. There is some very important communication that's going back and forth between Queen Esther and, and Mordecai. And, and, and he doesn't have a clue in how he is going to be used in the defeat of those who would cause harm to God's people, the Jews. And you know, as I think about that, do we realize every way that we're used by God? No, we don't. We can be encouraged to know that God is using us in ways that we don't even realize, that some people won't even tell you what kind of blessing that they have been to you. It, you, you, you and I can accidentally be a blessing, if you, if you know what I mean, in our sense. We're not, we're not trying to, but we're, but we're living our lives for the Lord in the will of God, and, and something has encouraged someone. Something has helped someone else, and we haven't realized when we have been with the one with the few loaves and the few fishes and have been a little part of something that God is doing. But nevertheless, it was an important part, and it was a part that couldn't be left out. God is up to something good 
all the time. And he's using us. Sometimes we realize what he wants us to do. Sometimes we're living our Christian lives. We're living our lives faithful to the Lord. And he is using that in people's lives. And we don't even realize it. There are small steps in many great things that God is doing. And and you are one of those small steps many times. God is God is good all the time and all the time God is good? Well, He's doing good all the time. In the midst of this difficult situation, God is doing something good. In the midst of your difficult situation and times when things seem so down and so low, God is doing something good in your life. Look, look at Joseph. And he thought that he was going to have to to cancel out the engagement to his wife Mary. And God was doing the greatest thing that he's ever done. He was manifesting his son into this world. It was something great. It wasn't something bad at all. So let us be encouraged when we start to struggle, when our minds try to get to this low point, when we're tempted to be depressed. Hey, God is doing good. Something good, whether we realize it or not. Galatians 6, 9 says, Let us not be weary in well-doing, for in due season we shall reap if we faint not. I tell you what, we, 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 start to, we start to dwindle down sometimes, and we start to get low, and the struggle is to, to take us under in, in, a, in a depression. It, let us be encouraged, though, that the child of God and the will of God is useful to the things of God. And God is always doing something good. God is always opening giant doors. But those doors are held by small hinges. And sometimes we're one of those hinges in what God is doing. So let us keep our heads up and keep looking to Him and be faithful. This this fellow, this fellow, not Haystack, but Haytack, he was a hinge, if you will, in this situation. In verses 7 and 8 that we read, Mordecai tells Haytack about the decree that has been sent out, and he also, Mordecai, gives him a copy of the writing of that decree. That right there tells you that Mordecai had a high position. Uh, in, in, in the city, in the kingdom, that he had a copy of that. And so he tells the story to Haytack. He gives a copy of that to Haytack, and, and he gives more instruction, more things in communication for Esther. And Haytack, in verse 9, delivers the message and takes the copy of the decree. And there's also a request that he made known to her that came from that came from Mordecai and the request was that she go before the king that she reveal to him that she is a Jew and at the end of verse 8 the message Mordecai gave to Hatak to give to her and to make request before him for her people. Why did, why did he make that known? He just made known to this messenger, Haytack, that she is a Jew when he gave in that message her people, the same people as she. Why? Maybe, maybe, he, maybe he is a Jew as well, and the Jews aren't going to go telling on another one in this, in this uh, moment in time that they're going through. I don't know what it is, but the more important question, the bigger question here is how is Esther going to respond to this? She finds out all at once here. She finds out that, that Haman has passed a decree to kill all of the Jews. She sees it in, in writing and she gets ad- advice in this communication from Mordecai that she's the one, that she needs to go to him, that she needs to reveal herself to him for the saving 
of her people. Well, let's look at the council in verses 10 through 14. He's not finished with the council about doing this, but there's some dialogue that goes back and forth between them some more with Hatak in the middle. So verse 10 says, Again, Esther, she responds to this now. She spake unto Hatak and gave him commandment unto Mordecai. All the king's servants and the people of the king's provinces do know that whosoever, whether man or woman, shall come unto the king into the inner court who is not called, there is one law of his to put him to death except such to whom the king shall hold out the golden scepter that he may live. But I have not been called to come in unto the king these 30 days. And they told to Mordecai Esther's words. Then Mordecai commanded to answer Esther, Think not with thyself that thou shalt escape in the king's house more than all the Jews." For if thou all together holdest thy peace at this time, then shall their enlargement and deliverance arise to the Jews from another place. But thou and thy father's house shall be destroyed. And who knoweth whether thou art come to the kingdom for such a time as this? I don't see Esther opposing Mordecai here and his counsel to her, but talking out the distress of this situation. Again, consider this. Even the queen could not barge in on the king and interrupt him and get his attention. That, that's something that was worthy of death. And she is receiving this all at one time. She, she, she got the letter, she got the message, and she, she now receives the counsel from Mordecai to, to go to him, to stop this, to save her people. And, and realize this also, they can't hear each other's tone. They, you know, uh, Haytack is doing the best job he can. He's probably a nervous wreck in one way with this highly important information he has that no one else can hear, and he needs to communicate this right back and forth. But, it, but it's kind of like when you text with people and you don't know what tone they're using. I, you know, I, I don't like that. I, I like talking in person better, even though I do both. I'd, I'd rather talk in person because you don't really know how someone feels and what they say. And, and uh, well, what do they mean by that? And you don't mean anything bad at all. You're nice and happy, and, and they think you're mad. Anyway, they're, they're not in person uh, for this council to be taking place. But I don't think that it's about her uh, not wanting to do it, but desiring guidance on this, this has hit her, it's impacting her, and how do I do this? Esther has always looked to Mordecai for guidance. You can tell he was a, a, a loving, caring, wise uh, guardian for her as he loved her and he raised her. And, and we remember from chapters back that when she became queen, she still, from, from, from the royal place she went to, she still listened to Mordecai, and she still uh, gleaned from his counsel to her. So, so he's giving counsel now. And, and so she has the news, and she's sorting this out now, um, communicating through this messenger. And, and let's just consider three clear facts in what Mordecai has said to Esther for just a minute. First, we see in verse 13 that he told her not to think uh, within herself that she'll escape from this killing of the Jews just, just because she's the queen, just because she is in a different place than the Jews scattered throughout the land. Mordecai says, don't just act like there's a guarantee that you are exempt from this. If she didn't approach the king 
And she remained silent. I mean, she's thinking about how she could be killed to go before the king. If she doesn't do it, you know, that didn't mean she was definitely going to be delivered from death. If Haman found out in some way that she was a Jew, then he would surely uh, do everything to try to put her to death, even though she's a palace resident. It was very possible that her nationality would be revealed. And uh, so whether inside or outside the palace, Jews were going to be killed. But there's another clear fact. Uh, there wasn't a guarantee that her silence would keep her alive. Another clear fact we see in the first part of verse 14. He says, for, for if thou altogether holdest thy peace at this time, then shall their enlargement and deliverance arise to the Jews from another place. But thou and thy father's house shall be destroyed. When we look at that, those two words there, another place, there couldn't be any more clarity that that's talking about God and His providence. Without using the name God and without using the word providence, it just couldn't be more clear what is meant there. You know, another place. God's hands are not tied when we rebel and refuse to do what, what He wants us to do. The prosperity preachers will, will put a spin on it like this. God can't do anything if you don't do it because He uses you. Look, we are privileged people of God that are used by Him. But make no mistake about it. God is going to get done what God wants to get done. He will use us, or if, if we back out of the will and the work of God, we are going to miss the blessing, miss the privilege, miss the growth, miss the work of God, and someone else is going to get it. Or we are going to be corrected, and we're going to be disciplined till we do it. And if we don't believe that, we need to just ask Jonah. And we can go over to that book of Jonah and just take a look at it and see. If God wants something done, He's going to get it done. Through our willingness or through our rebellion, he'll get it done. And, and, so, and so he says, you know, what if it's another place? Or, or the thought of what about it being another place? If God uses some other means to deliver the Jews, is he going to deliver every one of them? Will some not be spared? Could Esther be one of those who would not be spared? You know, could it, could it be for reason that she wouldn't be willing to be used by God to do it, that God wouldn't spare her? She was in a position where she knows to do good. You know, to, to, to know to do good and, and, and to not do it, you know, that's sin. And, and she is in a special position to do good. And if she doesn't, there's going to be some kind of consequences regardless in her life. And Mordecai is letting her know that she would be running a greater risk to keep quiet. Not, not, that, not that that's the stand that I believe she was taking in what she said, but, but she needs to be counseled along. And that's what Mordecai is doing. By, and, and so three clear truths here. You know, she wasn't guaranteed deliverance. If he goes to another place, God does, to deliver them, you know, would, would she be delivered? And then the end of verse 14 says, And who knoweth whether thou art come to the kingdom for such a time as this? This event of life that's taken place, this situation that Esther is in, it was not luck, it was not an accident, it was not coincidence that she was there. God and His providence again, in this verse, is spoken so clearly without those direct words being present. God has put her, Mordecai is saying, it just may be that God has put you right where you are in this moment of time so that you can be used of Him to save your people. 
God put her right there in that moment for the saving of her people. If she would just stop and review the path that got her there. I, we don't need to dwell on the past, but every now and then we ought to glance back. I glance back every now and then. And, you know, if, if you're in something at the moment and, and, and you're tempted to doubt you can glance back and see that God has taken you some, through something bigger than what you're going through in that moment. So we shouldn't dwell on the past, but it's, there's nothing wrong with glancing back. And if she would glance back for just a moment and see the path of the divine leading of God to the place that she is in now, she wouldn't be able to deny it. She wouldn't be able to deny that God was up to something, that God brought her to the throne for the help of His people. You know, God is accomplishing all sorts of things all of the time in this world for divine purposes, for His glory. Sometimes He's, you, he's doing something for an entire nation. Sometimes he's doing something for his individual children, the individual common people, right up to those who are established with authority and have a high position. Nothing and no one is outside the influence of the purpose of God. And he always has purpose in our life. And God uses people to accomplish His purposes, even those who are not His. You know, when somebody's going to have a surgery, I pray for God to use that doctor, and I don't need to know if that doctor's saved or not. Don't get me wrong. I, I love to know if He is, but, but, but God, God hit Nebuchadnezzar's heart and, and look, God will use someone for the sake of his own child. You know, think about what happened with the king here. The king in his foolishness had Vashti removed, and the king in his lowliness had Esther placed as queen. God will accomplish his purposes even when his people disobey. If Esther disobeys, you know, the Jews aren't necessarily going to use. God has another way, another place. Uh, not that she's to think that way. She is in a situation in this point in time, and something's laid on her heart, and, or, or, you know, the, it's set before her to be able to do for good, and she needs to do it. To, to tell on myself, this has been, this has been about uh, 13 years back that, that I had an opportunity to do something, do something good, good for the glory of God, good, to, good for someone else, good for me, good for the church, good for everything. And, and I didn't do it at that time. I, I was busy doing things, but I should have stopped and did it. And, and I was so convicted, and I tried. To, I looked very sensitively for any moment I could do again what I missed out on. It didn't come back around. And we need to take advantage of those things that God puts us in place to do. It is a blessing for us, and it's, more importantly, for His glory. She, Esther, if she disobeys, she's going to lose somehow. One way or another, she's going to lose. Concerning God's providence also, He has timing. He has timing in what He's done. Consider this event. And, and Vashti was queen for three years. And then there was no queen for four years. Then, after the king was in the twelfth year of his reign, this all came about with Haman and the killing of the Jews. And, but the way that, that that got arranged, when the decree went out, it was almost going to be a whole year away before that could happen with the death sentence. With the king's carnality 
And Haman's hatred through this stuff, somebody might ask, well, where is God? Somebody might say, well, God's a little late. Somebody might even have the audacity to say that God doesn't care, that God was up to nothing, but God doesn't feel pressured by his people and us trying to put him on a stopwatch. God is never too soon and he's never too late. He is right on time in his providence as we learn and think about the providence of God, his special care in our lives or however you want to lock that in. God in his providence as the third base coach and you're rounding second and he's telling you what to do. God in his special care out before us arranging things. Whenever, whenever you are tempted to doubt his providence, know that it's not up to my timing or yours, but it's up to his and his is perfect and we can trust it. He's not restricted by time in any way. Well, what, what did Esther do? What, what did she do? She received this, this beautiful counsel from, from Mordecai. So, so what happened? Let's look at verses 15 through 17 at the confidence. Then Esther bade them return Mordecai this answer. Go, gather together all the Jews that are present in Shushan and fast ye for me and neither eat nor drink three days, night or day, I also and my maidens will fast likewise, and so will I go in unto the king, which is not according to the law. And if I perish, I perish. So Mordecai went his way and did according to all that Esther had commanded him. Mordecai goes and he gathers together all the Jews for, for prayer and, and for a fast. And, and let me just interject something on, on mentioning fasting. And let, let me just say it this way. I believe the, the, the best, m most powerful fasting that we will do is not when we plan it, but when we don't even realize it's happening. When we are seeking the Lord so, so greatly, so earnestly for something in our lives that, that we don't even realize we have done without something. You know, that, that, we, that we're in His Word so much we don't even realize we haven't had anything to eat in eight hours. And, and so I, I think about that as just the, the, the sweetest carrying out of a fast that takes place when you, when, you, when you don't even plan it and it just happens because you are so intense on seeking the Lord for something. And so there was prayer and there was fast that was taking place. And in this book that does not have the name of God in it, I wonder who they're praying to. I wonder who they're fasting to. The true and the living Lord God is who they are seeking in this. You know, that's a... And what a, the, the, the Jews are all gathered together and they, they are seeking the Lord in, in a passionate way. What, what a great way for revival to happen. You know... We, someone said that, that uh, blessings in the Old Testament were, were, you know, your cattle, your livestock, your land, or things like that. And, and then they said blessings in the New Testament uh, are troubles. And not too many people amen that. But I tell you what, there are so many times that troubles come along and revival starts happening in our hearts. It shouldn't be. We should be grateful and thankful and seeking Him all the time when, when we're up on the mountaintop. But also, but I tell you what, down in the valley with many Christians, we seek Him like, like we hadn't been seeking Him. And revival starts to take place in our heart when I see that Mordecai has gathered together Jews and they're praying and they're fasting. I, I see revival for God's people. Troubles will put us on our knees before the Lord to be revived. Trouble brought Esther to 
the place of resolve that we see in the end of verse 16. Think about all the wickedness that has taken place, all of the evil of Haman and what he wants to do. And look where Esther is now. And so will I go, I go in unto the king, which is not according to the law. It's not okay to do it. There's a law against it, but I'm going to go in unto the king. And if I perish, I perish. Wow, what a strong spiritual resolve in the middle of a wicked time that's taking place. Here is Esther ready to do God's will no matter what the cost is. Greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. There's a lot of evil going on, and, and Esther is willing to do God's will no matter what. May we not waste our troubles in our difficult times that we're going through. God wants to do something amazingly powerful in that time. Don't waste your t- troubles. And, and may we not forget God when everything seems to be against us. Everything's going downhill. Nothing seems to be going right. I mean, I mean look at Esther. Every, everything seemed to be against her. The law was against her here. The government was against her here. That, she is a Jew. The decree was against her here. All of the officers were against her. But, and, 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 and we can relate sometimes in situations in our lives But if God be for us, who can be against us? We never have to give up hope on Him. That gives us confidence to seek the Lord no matter what the cost is. When God's for us, who can be against us? That's something we can rest in, but that's also something that we can act on. What a day of decision for Esther here to do what was right when everything seemed to be coming against her. And and for us, and for us, what kind of decision are we going to come into? Maybe, maybe someone's in a day of decision right now. And, and with everything seeming to come against you or, or the thought of a lot coming against you, how much is it worth doing the right thing and glorifying God and obeying the Holy Spirit? Maybe you have a day of decision or you have one in the near future. And, and may you be willing to do what's right no matter what the cost, just as Esther has decided to do here. And next Wednesday, we will be back in chapter 5. And, and I love being encouraged and having hope, and being full of joy by His Word, and because what God was doing there, He's, he's still up to great things today, amen? Uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to ask uh, Brother John tonight if he'll close our Bible study in a word of prayer, and then uh, be careful driving home, and be safe, and love you all. God bless you.